Hello everyone and welcome to this Decred Research read-through. Today we're going to go over my paper on the mining market mechanics and really what this particular paper is looking at is everything to do with de Decred proof-of-work mining and we're going to run through everything from a, a general overview about how mining actually works and what some of the game theoretic layers and you know some of the decisions that miners have to make as they enter into their investment. We're going to look at the history of Decred mining how it transitioned from a, a phase of GPU-focused mining into an ASIC-focused mining. We're going to look at some of the distribution analytics, so using some research that Richard Red pulled together, actually tracking uh, the UTXOs of mined uh, DCR and seeing whereabouts it actually ended up and seeing the different behavior curves between GPUs and ASICs. We're going to go over a number of charts looking at the actual hash rate and matching that to the types of devices that have actually been on the network, ranging from GPUs all the way through to ASICs, and seeing how many of those different uh, pieces of hardware you would actually need to match the current hash rate, what kind of power consumption there is, estimate OPEX and CAPEX, and then from that we can start to deduce an idea about the profitability of all of these. And within all of this, we start to see a, a bit of a, a history or a timeline of events that have occurred, and what's really interesting about Decred is we have a number of different on-chain metrics. Some of them have been borrowed from the Bitcoin space, but are broadly applicable to proof of work, and some are specific to the Decred chain. And we can actually see this history play out once we've gone through the profitability understanding, we've gone through which devices are available on the network, um, and the different timelines of all of those events. We can actually see this showing up in our on-chain metrics. So um, the last part will really stitch that together so we can really see how it comes together. So um, we'll, we'll start by running off um, and credit to official cryptos on Twitter who pulled together the, uh, the, the intro artwork. He's done a great job and uh, I think it kind of st tells a story. Um, so in terms of just a bit of a quick roadmap, the, uh, the two long didn't listen. Um, the distribution data really tells us that the GPU miners and largely they were dual mining uh, with, with Ethereum basically immediately distributed the DCR. There's, there's a lot of data and anecdotal evidence to say that they basically mined it and sold it. There was very little uh, hodling. There's a distinct change in that behavior as the ASICs come online. We start to see more, more of those coins ending up in tickets or unspent, so some kind of hodling behavior going on. We're consistently seeing ASIC miners selling about 30 to 40 percent of their coins to exchanges, and the other 30 percent is most likely going to, uh, it's going to unknown destinations, but there's a good chance that they're actually OTC desks. And roughly 30% of those are actually being staked. So there's at least for one ticket. So there is a, a layer of skin in the game uh, for ASIC miners, which is actually not prevalent for, for the GPU miners. And I think the most important study out of all of this is that whilst there's been an immense uh, challenge for ASIC miners due to the timing of their investment and when they actually spun up their, uh, their operations at the peak of the 2018 bull market, uh, and it's basically been uh, depressed prices ever since, Proof of work has done one of the most important things that it does very well, and that is distribute coins. And particularly for a chain like Decred, this is very important to actually get a wide distribution because that distributes the governance vote. And uh, you know, it's a completely fair access for people to get involved in the network and have a meaningful say. So really, proof of work has done exactly what it was designed to do. So the paper starts with a bit of an overview about how mining works. This is more of a fundamental layer. Uh, as to how how you know proof of work as a as a whole works, the general gist of proof of work is that it functions as almost a, a needle in a haystack type problem, and when there's lots of people looking for the needle, uh, the haystack will grow. The protocol will actually it's called the difficulty adjustment. It will increase the size of the haystack and make it more challenging for the more people to find the needle. And the idea of this is that as people are looking, which is the the hash power that's going on, the machines that are actually doing the calculations, the complex puzzle. As people are looking for this needle, which is essentially the, the, the solution to the puzzle that solves the next block, if lots of people start looking for it, you make the, the, the haystack larger, it, it, the same amount of people have to spend the same amount of time on a, prob on a probabilistic standpoint to actually find it. And that's how we target the, the um, standard block time of 300 seconds for Decred, uh, five minutes. The idea is that no matter how much hash power is on the network, Every 12 hours, the protocol will change the difficulty up or down to make the haystack larger or smaller to make sure that that target block time is always hit. So that's that's really the, the, the function of what's going on. And the only way that proof of work um, uh, can actually, a block can be found via proof of work is by having that valid hash. And there's no way to actually find that hash on a probabilistic standpoint 
uh, without actually burning the computational energy. So it ensures that there's an unforgeable layer there. So I've distilled down what the purpose of proof of work really is. And in, in my mind, there's three core areas. The first one is machine consensus. Proof of work, because it is longest chain, Nakamoto consensus is follow the chain with the most amount of accumulated work over time. It's very easy for machines to agree on what the truth is, because if any chain comes along that has less accumulated proof of work, the machines can immediately reject it. It's a very easy mechanism by which machines can maintain that unforgeable consensus. There's the unforgeable costliness layer, which is that you need to burn the energy in the hardware investment. There is no way to find a hash consistently without having expended that energy. And that basically imbues DCR coins with a unforgeable locked-in energy component. There is an, you cannot acquire them from a minting process in proof of work without actually expending that energy. So it, it provides that kind of inbuilt structure and value add um, that, that, that really can't be built in any other way. And the third main reason is that distribution, making sure that because the miners are burning that energy, they've invested in hardware, they are forced, they're the largest compulsory sellers and they are forced to sell those coins onto the market. And that ensures that people have an access. You know, people can actually get in there with sell pressure, which does bring prices down and equalize, equalize itself. It allows people to actually enter the market um, in a fair and equitable way because they, they must be sold and you get a dilution of all stakeholders. And particularly for Decred, the, with the proof of work at 60% of the block reward, it ensures that even stakers are always going to be diluted out of the system. And it means that they have to continue to reinvest in order to maintain their stake. So this is the nature of, of proof of work and really what it does very well. And you know, I summarized it here by saying proof of work imbues DCR with unforgeable costliness. It gives the chain immutable characteristics and coins are widely distributed. So that's really in a function, that is what proof of work does. Make sure that the coins are scarce, you can't forge them in any other way. It makes it very expensive to unwind the chain, which is that immutability, and it ensures that they get widely distributed because of the, uh, the unforgeable expense on energy and hardware. So for miners, there's a capex and opex layer. They have to actually invest in the hardware in the first place, particularly as they move into the ASIC realm. Um, and then they have an OPEX expense. They've got capital that sometimes they have to borrow on debt to actually buy those ASICs. So there's capital cost, um, there's human resources, there's energy, there's facilities, there's cooling. There's all sorts of elements that come into this um, that in order to actually maintain and continue running their mining facility. So all of these are unforgeable expenses that you cannot mine a block without doing. And therefore you have costs denominated in, in uh, fiat currency that you therefore need to sell that income, those coins, in order to actually make back that money and pay back your debts and, and OPEX costs. Now, the challenge here is that the block subsidy is consistently reducing. And when you and, and not only that, the difficulty adjustment is always deleveraging and actually bringing things back into equilibrium when there's too much or not enough hash. So the notion here is that it's a very competitive environment. And really, it comes down to there's, there's strong miners and weak miners. And the strong miners are those that make good decisions. Weak miners are ones that don't necessarily have the good decisions um, or get the timing just wrong. And really, because it's an always deleveraging system and the amount of income they have coming in is always reducing, any mistake is quite heavily penalized just by the natural, uh, the natural system. So it is a very, very competitive uh, system. So a little quick snapshot on the history of Degrid mining. It launched into a, uh, a market that in 2016 that already had many GPU coins and, and there was a developed ecosystem around GPU mining. So the initial difficulty was set to be about 250 uh, GPUs and um, very shortly after, so there was an initial uh, mining period where it was just GPU hobbyists. Um, by about April 2016, there was a piece of software called Claymore that came out that allowed dual mining of uh, Decred with Ethereum. Now, what that means is that um, it takes the same GPU, but it utilizes different parts of the architecture. So you can actually mine with a little extra expense, both coins at the same time. So what this um, actually did is it, it boosted Decred hash rate immensely. And um, talking with Not So Fast on one of our podcast episodes, he mentioned that it actually pushed Decred along the Lindy curve of you know, existing and having a secure network. And the, tr the, the trade off of this is that we actually saw these Ethereum miners who were predominantly uh, mining Decred basically as a tip. It's just like an extra bonus. They didn't particularly care about the project. Um, they basically sold those coins onto the market. 
So there's a trade-off there between it. it. It gave Decred that security level that was unable to be attained um, uh, without you know going through the gauntlet of trying to attract miners, um, but simultaneously created a, a large portion of sell pressure. And we see this in the very early years of, uh, of Decred's price history. And then as we came into 2018, there was a transition from GPUs to ASICs. And there's a number of uh, Decred assembly episodes on YouTube, which are worth watching. Um, if you want to understand more about it, that talks about some of these ASIC manufacturers and their incentives for coming on board. So in this particular table, what I've tried to summarize is the, the nature of GPU versus ASIC mining. And at the end of the day, it all boils down to the, uh, the, the unforgeable or the skin in the game uh, within each of these mining classes. So for GPUs, they can switch between different algorithms. It's not a trivial process, but they can do it. So that means that if a, you know, a coin that they were mining uh, doesn't make it and, and, and falls into the abyss, they can move on to the next uh, the next coin. Or if it's not profitable, they can turn off a portion of their rigs and transition them onto another, uh, another coin. So um, more or less, the hash power is more fluid. It can move around. GPU miners, are, in general, the hardware is more distributed. There's still a layer of uh, centralization in the pools and, and things like that. But um, you, you get this flexibility in GPU mining. But what it does lack is the skin in the game. People didn't invest money specifically in an ASIC that mines Decred. For ASICs, however, that is the case. And there is then a loyalty to that hashing algorithm and protecting that chain. Because if you invest several million dollars in ASIC hardware and you know um, the chain comes under attack, it's actually in your best interest to protect your investment and make sure that that chain is well defended. So there, there is actually a loyalty to the hashing algorithm because the, the ASIC itself is a paperweight in any other context. It can't be repurposed the same way that a GPU can. So there is a loyalty that gets uh, uh, put into there. And really, at the end of the day, um, ASICs accept and embrace the fact that mining over time will centralize. This, this is kind of a nature of a declining block subsidy energy and power tends to centralize over time. We see this even on national power grids. So there is a very uh, strong correlation between the scale of an operation and the larger an operation is, the more likely they are to be able to gain increasing hash share in such a competitive market. Um, so what you end up with is this gradual centralization, which more or less will happen at the end of the day in all contexts. Um, and it does give those miners a larger role in governance, which we'll see shortly, is, uh, is actually a strong thing in my, my perspective. I think they're a, they're a core component uh, to a network security and, and longevity. And I'm actually, you know, I actually quite like the fact that the miners have a, a role in the governance. I think that's an important layer to this whole mix. Um, and then there is also an, an increase in compulsory selling. So rather than just transitioning a portion of your GPUs onto another network to find profitability elsewhere, um, because the miners have invested in ASICs and they need to recover their costs, there is going to be a compulsory selling component that comes into this that really cannot be avoided uh, in this instance. So, and again, we see this uh, play out in Decred's history. Um, there's a table here that I've more or less documented the key, uh, all ranging from the three main GPUs that I understand were mining on the chain or that were the contemporary um, top miners at the time. Um, and then the whole list of uh, ASIC devices that have come out at, at various points in time. And you can see the first one started to come out in, uh, in January 2018. Um, and then we really started to see the um, uh, it pick up around April. April is really where we saw the hash rate start to really explode uh, and expand. And, you know, and with time, these ASICs increase in their hash potential. So we're talking about you know, fractions of a terahash per second back in the GPU phase, um, and then into the, the more modern miners. Um, and these three at the bottom, the D1, the DR5, uh, and the U1 double plus are really the, the contemporary miners at this point in time. Um, and they're the ones that really operate on the network at this point in time in, uh, based on this study. And you can see here, so this is mapping out the DCR total income to miners in the black line in, uh, in USD terms, the equivalent in DCR terms, which you can see is, is continually uh, um, uh, reducing in value. And uh, this is the block subsidy that's slowly reducing over time uh, as it tends towards that 21 million cap. And then the hash rate shown in pink. And what's actually important here, the, the real take home from this, is that um, if we look at the December capitulation back here in 2018, Decred fell down to an a approximate average price, uh, more of a stabilized price, about $15. At the time of writing, uh, we were in a very similar range, $15, $16. So the price is actually very much the same at this point in time. 
The big difference is that this declining block subsidy means that the income for miners back here at $15 was about $55,000 a day. The income here is about $30,000 a day. So there's a 33% drop in miner income despite DCI trading at the same price over that two year period. And that's really what's going on here. There is a gradual reduction, a slow bleed out of this value for miners, which makes it increasingly difficult to stay afloat uh, until you get price appreciation. So that's why there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation between price and hash rate. Um, and you can see here in October, that's really October 2019, this is a key date. We start seeing this big dip off, um, which again, somewhat correlates with a coin price drop. Um, but even so, we've had a, a coin price drop in March 2020, and we've actually seen an increase in hash rate uh, more from a few months after that. So there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation because it's so dynamic with how many miners are on the network, um, difficulty adjustments, things like that. So, and we'll talk about this shortly. Um, part three looks at the dis distribution analysis. This is based on some of the data that Richard Red wrote for one of the Decred blogs. And he essentially tracked um, uh, UTXOs that were mined, so freshly mined coins, and he watched where they went for five hops. And there's a few different baskets that they ended up in. Um, one being, did it end up at an, a known exchange address? Uh, so there's a handful of those that we basically follow and you, you back calculate which ones, uh, you know, which exchange those coins are going to. That's the exchange portion. There's whether they go into a ticket. Now, it doesn't follow what happens after that ticket. It just says that the coins went from a mined state and within five hops ended up in a ticket. There's an unknown basket, which is addresses that we just don't know. And this is the nature of blockchain analysis. Over time, you get more resolution, but we don't necessarily know what all addresses are. And then there's a few more buckets which are unspent or um, or small change. So the un, the unspent and uh, and small change are very small by comparison. Most of these coins do get spent into some purpose. Um, there are some unspent coins, and we more or less assume that they're either lost or or long term held by the miners themselves. Um, and I lump them in with tickets as held coins. And what this next chart is basically showing is, and, and I'll talk this through one at a time. On the left hand side is the proportion of income. So for example, a level of 70% means that 70% of the income to miners has gone to a particular destination. Now the solid lines here, blue is GPU, orange is ASIC. So you can see there's a transition here. I, I've picked it arbitrarily at January 2018, which is where we saw the first ASICs come on. But really the behavior kind of shifts around April. That's probably the, the key area where it, it really swaps over is, uh, is, is in April, where we see that hash rate expansion. So in around this zone here. Now, the solid lines are showing how much of the income that came in is being exchanged. And this is going to some kind of known exchange address. Now, this uh, blue turning into red curve is of the total global um, proof of work income in DCR. The yellow solid line is saying, okay, let's pretend that, that we only care about ASIC miners. So reset the global issuance to zero at that point. How much of the from January onwards uh, is going to exchanges? And that's why you see this divergence here. So what this is showing is that GPU miners sold around 70 to 80%, right? That's their, their typical, uh, and it kind of stabilized in here 2016, 2017, which by the way, was also the point in time where we had the maximum dip in decred price, which you can kind of see in the hash rate line here. Um, this is basically saying that they're selling between 60 to 80% of their coins almost immediately. And in some of those uh, decred assembly talks, Dave Collins also ran this study and he was seeing a very similar thing where almost within a single hop, uh, the coins were ending up in at an exchange address. So GPU miners were more or less selling on mass without thinking too much about it. They were only staking, which is this dash line, somewhere between two and two and a half percent, so very little of the income. And the remaining 17 and a half goes to some kind of unknown address, whether that's OTC or peer-to-peer -peer or whether the miners held them, we're not sure. So that's kind of the unknown bucket. Now, for the ASIC miners, what this uh, orange curve here is showing is that as of today, 60% or thereabouts of the global, so that includes all the GPU mined and the ASIC mined, so 60% of the income has gone to an exchange, a known exchange. So what this is showing is that the ASIC miners have actually been compensating for the lack of holding over here. There's something else going on with ASIC miners where it's been a very distinct shift in behavior. 
So when we just look at the ASIC line, this is basically saying during the early phase when they just launched their ASICs, you can see that they're selling between 70, 60, 50% of their coins. But over time, it's actually now stabilized somewhere around 40%. So this is telling us that they actually sell about 35 to 40% on known exchange addresses. Now, there's another component to that, which is about an increase from this 17.5% to 25, 30%, which we don't know where it went. Now, given the sophistication of ASIC miners, they have larger operations, they probably have um, you know, other operations in different coins and their, their experience in this space. It is very likely that a large portion of this 25, 30 is going to some kind of OTC desk which we wouldn't be tracking on an exchange basis, but this is the most likely scenario. It could otherwise be hodled or gone into private wallets, but I think this is the most likely as it's going into OTC. And the very interesting part here, and we look at this dashed yellow line here, we're talking about 25 to 30% of these uh, of, of ASIC mining coins goes into a ticket. Now, again, we don't know if they stake one ticket and then they sell it afterwards. We don't know what happens over time. We're not tracking to that level of, of detail, but most certainly, 25 to 30% of income is ending up in a ticket almost immediately. So that's that's a very interesting insight and a very distinct shift from the GPU type to the ASIC type. It's a very interesting uh, shift in behavior and again shows that skin in the game of ASIC miners. So part four then looks at the performance and profitability of Decred miners. And this is, this is the, the general premise of this study is we have a hash rate. And that table that I showed you earlier has all of the hash rate um, capabilities of the different ASIC devices and, and GPU devices. So let's let's imagine a theoretical world where the entire chain is mined by a, a D9 miner, right, or a DR5 miner. How many devices do we need to match that hash rate, right? So it gives us a, count, a kind of an estimated count. And because it's very difficult to actually ascertain who bought what and when, sale numbers and all that kind of stuff, this is a nice way to just understand on a per device basis, how do they perform relative to their peers? So we'll look at a few things. The first one is looking at the device count. So this is essentially looking at how many devices of each type, single fleet, only one type would match the, the scene hash rate. And each of these curves starts more or less on the day that the, uh, the ASIC was launched. So obviously there's a lot more dynamics there's other other machines all operating and it's a it's you know it's an intertwined web of different machines and miners and costs and all this kind of thing but we go through a number of these these uh these charts and we'll, we'll get a bit of a picture of what's going on so in order to match the current hash rate or the peak hash rate i should say we need 3.8 million gpus which is quite incredible it kind of gives you a scale of how much hardware you actually need to to mine dcr and you can also see the change in efficiency between 3.8 million GPUs or 16 to 12,000 ASICs. So this is the more likely number of actual machines operating on the network. And you can see the massive efficiency. And you know, as we descend down here, this is increasing hardware efficiency. And you can see the massive difference in, uh, in just sheer volume. And what's interesting here is if we compare it to the Bitcoin network, which is uh, you know, the largest proof of work network, with its current hash rate and taking its most contemporary uh, S19 Pro rig, um, we're talking to about 1.2 million S19s. So it's about 77 times more than the decred chain in terms of just silicon that's currently operating on the network in best case scenarios. Um, granted, this study doesn't assume any kind of efficiency loss and all that kind of stuff. Um, it does assume a perfect scenario, but again, we're, we're comparing peer to peer here. So the notion is to look at things on a relative scale. The next thing that we look at is the amount of capex. So how much would have to be spent in order to acquire those device counts that we just calculated? So that's about $2 billion on GPUs uh, based on the, the, the listing price that we have in the table at the very top of this article, and about 12 and a half million spent on ASICs. Now this is an unforgeable barrier. If someone wants to step in and attack the Decred network, they need to come in with $12.5 million worth of silicon to actually start, um, and that's without OPEX and all the logistics and things like this. Um, and uh, for this particular check, there's a 5% markup on, on all of the device expenses, just to layer in the costs of actually developing a site and logistics and shipping and all that kind of stuff. All those planning, all those CapEx elements, uh, it's just been um, grouped into a 5% marker. But this gives you a scale again on the, the amount of CapEx required to attack it from a GPU uh, versus some um, uh, contemporary ASICs. 
If we then look at daily power consumption, you can see again this massive efficiency boost uh, given by ASICs. We're talking about a transition from gigawatt hours to megawatt hours in, on a daily basis. So this just shows you the scale of, uh, of different power consumption. And again, we do our comparison to the Bitcoin network using that same S19 Pro. And if we actually compare those, we're talking about 134x more power consumed on the Decred, on the Bitcoin network than the Decred network. Now, the simplest way to do this, because there's lots of components and moving pieces that define what the OPEX is, there's power costs and cooling and human resources and planning and all this kind of stuff. What I've more or less done is looked at an all-in sustaining cost. So not dissimilar to what we see for gold mines, where they have an all-in sustaining cost per ounce. What we're looking at here is an all-in sustaining cost per kilowatt hour, per unit of expense. So, um, and I've used the actual income level. So we saw that previously on that black line where we have the daily income. The assumption here is that mining is extremely competitive. And if you're a strong miner, you're going to be operating on a very, very narrow margin of profit. So that means that the, you know, over time, the amount that a, of OPEX that a miner is spending is going to converge towards the daily reward that is available. Because if someone is spending 99 cents, someone's going to step in and spend 99.5 cents, right? It's, it's going to keep stepping up in order to, until it reaches that actual daily income level. So my assumption here is that strong miners are operating at a very, very small profit margin. And that helps me define a all-in sustaining cost for a strong miner. And a weak miner is what I define as someone who's now operating at somewhat of a loss and has consistently operated at some kind of loss. And using those two frames of reference and then the chart that's about to come up, we basically define a strong miner as something where it's about seven and a half cents per kilowatt hour, all in sustaining costs. And a weak miner is about 12 and a half cents per uh, kilowatt hour. Now, this is those charts that I was just referring to. The red line is the daily income afforded to proof of work miners. And then these curves here are showing, based on our estimated efficiency levels and, uh, and actual hash rate output, how many devices are operating on the network and the power consumption of them. Um, this is the estimated OPEX costs in all of these different curves. And you can see here that as we are in, in today's market, there's going to be a reduction. You can probably tell that the cost to operate GPUs has continued to skyrocket because you need so many of them as ASICs come online. And again, we're talking about somewhere around there's January 2018, so April, where we had the uh, the hash rate really expand. And you can see here that the daily reward available for um, all lines above the red are essentially uh, losing money. They're spending more. Their OPEX is higher than the daily reward amount. So they're plotted on the same axis. And any that are underneath are in profit. So you can see here that these early ASICs were in profit, early GPUs were in profit, and basically all ASICs when they launched were in profit under a strong miner assumption. This is also the case for a weak miner assumption. However, you can see that they more quickly head above the red line and are therefore operating at a loss. So this is how I've defined these all-in sustaining costs. We can see here that our strong miners are pulling in between 15 and 42,000 within this box. Obviously there's a bit of a range because of fluctuations at an income of about 40,000. So if we look at this kind, kind of scale, there's a small profit to be made. For weak miners, however, if they were operating at full capacity, they would be at operating at a loss. So this is how I've defined those two levels. And it's worth noting that seven and a half cents is extremely lean. That is a very, very efficient miner who's done a, you know, a remarkable job of keeping it at that level. And a weak miner, even 12 and a half cents is still relatively, uh, relatively lean. So it shows you how competitive this particular market actually is. So now we can look at fleet profitability. So we've defined the capex, we've defined the power consumption, and we've defined the opex expense. Now profitability says if you spend $1,000 on an ASIC and you run it for a day, how much of that $1,000 do you recuperate? If you uh, pull back uh, $10 per day, you've paid off 1%. If you pull back $100 a day, you've paid off 10%. So this daily profitability is basically looking at how much of the original capex as a percent or as a, a fraction are you pulling in per day. So you can see here that using the, um, uh, this is the strong minor chart, but we'll look at the other ones. Um, the GPUs more or less operated at a profit all the way through to, again, April 2018, which is when ASICs really launched. The difficulty went up, the hash rate went up, and now GPUs are no longer profitable, which actually lines up with where it crossed the income line higher up. 
You can see these early ASICs start at very, very high profitability ratios, but rapidly collapse down and anything below this uh, the, the zero bound is essentially losing money. So you can see how amazingly competitive this market actually is, where these ASIC devices launch into profit, difficulty adjusts upwards, and then they end up in a position of unprofitability, especially as faster rigs launch into that same market. And you can see here that we actually compress very low. So what I've done is the next few charts have actually zoomed in on this history so we can understand a little bit more about what's going on. So from the strong miner assumption, you can see here that many of these rigs were in profit and then have gone into negative territory, which means that they're now essentially superseded models. There's newer, faster, uh, and better ASIC hardware that is now more profitable than they are. They just can't compete. That's really what's going on. And you can see here that the contemporary ASICs, which are these thicker green lines, have really toyed with uh, being profitable. And particularly after the March 2020 sell-off, things got very, very grim. And they're really maintaining something like a 0.01% or 0.1% profitability, um, very, very low profit margins. And again, this all lines up with the, uh, the general reduction in hash rate. October 2019 is really where we started to see hash rate start falling off. And you can see this here is that we're actually getting a reduction in the profitability uh, of all of these different rigs. So we're talking about 0.1 to 0.2% per day in CapEx recovery um, once all expenses are accounted for. And that's the strong miner, very lean strong miner assumption. If we look at the weak miners, however, we have a very different story. We have the same profitability in the early days, but we can see here that again, October 20, uh, 2019, that's where we start losing profitability, which means some of these rigs would have been switched off, which indicates, which is you know shows up in the hash rate reduction. And you can see here that only recently are they starting to get any kind of profitability back in at this 12 and a half cent all in sustaining cost. So this puts into perspective why we actually had that hash rate drawdown in October and that we're really only just starting to see grass shoots uh, showing up at the other, the other side. And finally, the last chart set looks at uh, the capex recovery. So let's assume that a miner operates under these assumptions and they make every day they're making 0.1%. If they run that operation for 10 days, they've now accumulated 10 times 0.1%, which now creates 1%. So they've paid off 1% of their capex. So if we do a cumulative sum, so every day that they're in operation, they're making money, right? Or they're losing money, depending on where the opex goes. If we do a sum, we can actually see when those devices paid themselves off, when they broke above the, uh, the level of one. Now, that's what this level of one here is showing. It means device repaid. So GPUs paid themselves off and then are all good. This is again, strong minor assumption. Um, GPUs paid themselves off and then away they go. So they've basically paid the device off and they're now just floating on profit. Um, the early ASICs, again, very similar type curve. They've come up, they've reached profitability, and they're good to run. The, G, the D, D1s are still in profit. D1, U, U1++, and the uh, DR5 are the contemporary rigs. And you can see that in, let's just go back to our point here of October 2019, you can see all these outdated rigs essentially never reach profitability, and this falling off a cliff is essentially capitulation into permanently unprofitable uh, realms. It means that the devices are no longer competitive in the current hash rate, they just can't compete. They burn too much power to generate a hash. So we're seeing that the contemporary rigs are slowly approaching break even. And because we're starting to see the hash rate increase, this gives us more confidence that this actually this model is actually giving us a fairly reasonable insight into all of this. So there are some profitable rigs operating on the network and the, uh, the other contemporary rigs are certainly approaching profitability. For weak miners, however, we actually have the opposite. We're seeing that even the most uh, advanced, even the, the most state-of-the-art rigs are essentially going through a process of capitulation, particularly after this March sell-off. Um, profitability really went down the drain. And we can see here that we more or less have a global capitulation. And even the D1s that were, and, and the GPUs, which have been in profit for a long time, are actually starting to approach an unprofitable static. So in reality, this means that rigs will have been switched off um, to try and capture this behavior. But this really just goes to show how savage the market is. When we're talking about 12 and a half cents versus seven and a half cents, um, really being make or break. So it's a very, very cutthroat um, uh, type market. 
And the final thing we're going to look at is the on-chain metrics. So just to start with this, let me talk you through the miner psychology or the cycle that miners go through. So ASIC miners are serious bulls. They've invested a very significant amount of unforgeable capex into in, in, into the chain. So they can't repurpose those ASICs for anything else. They are now committed to the decred chain and they are therefore the largest compulsory sellers. So they're accumulating that DCR and a large portion of them will have some kind of treasury in order to actually build up because they believe in the asset. That's why they've invested so much money into the, into the mining hardware. So over time, these miners who have treasuries during miner feast or when the going is good, they will try to sell as few coins as possible. And by not selling those coins, right, they'll sell how much they need to cover their costs. But if they're maintaining a share over the network, and we're seeing this in the staking behavior, actually, that we looked at before in the distribution, what we're more or less getting is a, um, a layer of um, uh, building up those treasuries and that will constrain supply. So there's now less coins coming onto the market to actually create that sell pressure. And this way, this way you get this constraining of supply during the good times. As we move into a period of minor famine, where you get some kind of, you know, the bear market that we experienced in 2018, and you actually get the opposite effect. Because their prices, the, the cost that they have, whether it's um, CapEx recovery or OpEx, these are all denominated in fixed cost fiat. They still have to spend money on their power bill. They still have to spend money on rent and hosting costs and cooling. You can't avoid that. So therefore, they have to sell more coins in order to recover those costs. So it, they actually exacerbate the selling pressure during the bad times, during the famine. Um, and during feast, they do the opposite. They constrain the supply and keep it into their treasuries. And eventually, after extended periods of minor stress, ultimately, there's going to be some kind of capitulation. And you know, once they turn off as many rigs as they possibly can, they've already sunk cost into the capex, so they may as well keep them running until they're literally burning power at no profit. So at that point, they will switch them off, and then eventually, some of those miners will have to capitulate. And during that process of capitulation, a weak miner will capitulate because they didn't have the most capital efficient operation. But that leaves room, the difficulty adjusts down, their hash rate comes off the network, difficulty comes down, and then the strong miners can now turn on more of their rigs in order to gain that hash share. Because they were operating in a more profitable standing, they can now actually expand and increase their share of the hash rate, which is again how we get that gradual centralization of proof of work. It's one of those inevitable features of it is that you actually get the, uh, this then um, swaps it over. So we've gone through the famine, we've gone through the capitulation event, the strong miners gain hash share, and then they start constraining the supply again because they can start building up their treasuries waiting for the next move. So, you know, this is really that cyclical behavior where they accelerate the downside and the upside, and there's this transition that we have to go through. And, you know, a bit of fun here, but the uh, as an ancient cypherpunk proverb goes, miners put the bottom in. And what we're about to see with these on-chain metrics is how this is actually played out, especially tied in with all of the stuff we've just looked at in terms of capitulation levels and the like. So just briefly, the block subsidy models was developed by Permanent Nino, and what this looks at is a cumulative sum of all the USD paid to proof of work miners, or all the other stakeholders as well, um, on the supply side of Decred. And what we can see is that when market value falls below the orange line, which is the total, so summing the treasury, stakers, and proof of work, um, we start to get the whole network is actually now operating at some kind of a loss, right? And as an aggregate income basis, the supply side of Decred is under stress. And we can, when it falls under the red line, which is the proof of work line, it suggests that miners explicitly are now under quite a bit of stress. So really what this is indicating is when we have some kind of financial stress, and you can actually see that both times that prices dropped below the proof of work line, we actually had a fairly strong rebound back to the upside. So again, it comes back to miners put the bottom in. If we now compare that to the difficulty ribbon that Willy Wu originally developed, this is more or less a move, string of moving averages. So everything from the nine, the 14, 25, all the way to the 200 period moving average of difficulty. During periods of time when miners are switching off their rigs, the difficulty will wind down and the slower 200 day moving average will catch up to the, to the nine and the 14 and the 25. And what happens is you get this difficulty squeeze, which is what we've seen occur here and what we've occurred for a long extended period of time here. And you can actually see that the, the peak or the bottom of the difficulty squeeze and the point of re reversion actually occurs at the same time that valuation has fallen below the block subsidy line. So this 
actually provides some kind of validation of a capitulation type level. This is really the bottom of the market and it's pointing to these two different levels and you can actually see back here as well, we had a slight reduction in that hash rate initially where it fell below the, uh, the initial income line. So these are levels of stress and you can actually see the expansion of hash rate as ASICs came online uh, in around January time. This just shows how explosive it is. You get this expansion of hash rate and then during the difficult times you get a squeeze. But this correlation between these two metrics gives us actual validity that the, the two of them are working as designed. Now the Pule multiple uh, was originally developed by David Pule, and the notion of this is it takes the 365 day moving average of USD minor income. So how many dollars are being paid worth of DCR to miners every day? And because miners are long-term thinkers, they have long investment horizons. If we take a yearly average of that, that's kind of their baseline. That's what they're measuring their today's income versus last time's income. So we take a ratio between to, um, today's income and the, the yearly average of their income. And if we look at the, um, the probabilities of how frequently different pure multiple values have occurred, we can actually generate this table here, which is more or less pointing out um, only 10% of Decred's history has pure multiple been uh, 0.4 into signaling minus stress. And when they're making a lot of money, when the, the current price is much higher than their 365 day moving average, in only 10% of, of, of occasions, that's about 2.8, which means that the price is 2.8 times their annual um, annualized income. So th these are more or less looking at the probability of occurrence, which gives us again, a probability that price or value will stay there. So when price moves into a very unlikely region, say the extreme 10% to the low side, there's a 90% chance that it wants to spring back towards the mean. And that, that's really what this is telling us. And again, that lines up with uh, miners putting the bottom in. And that's then plotted out in these bands. So the top red is a 10% chance of occurrence. Bottom green is 10% chance of occurrence. Um, light green and light red are then 20%. And then the, the normal trading range is then about 60% of Decred's history, um, not being in one of these extreme zones. And you can see again that we've got that initial difficulty, the, the difficulty squeeze both back in uh, 2017, 2016, and in uh, 2020. And we can actually see that initial point where price dropped below the total income line, block subsidy line, was also picked up as an extreme after the December capitulation. And then we have these two tops, which actually showed up as extreme periods of minor profitability, um, which generally means there's going to be some kind of reversion. If they're in a, a large amount of profit, they're probably going to start taking more profit. Now, that's not to say that miners dictate the direction of the market. There's lots of um, factors involved here of traders are in the same position. But generally, there's oversold and overbought uh, levels in all markets. And these oscillators provide some kind of mean reversion point um, where price is going to oscillate around over time. And that's really what the pure multiple is telling us with a focus on that mining supply side. And the final metric is the mining pulse. Now, the mining pulse is a metric Permeable Nino developed, which more or less looks at our target block time of 300 seconds. We know that Decred adjusts its difficulty every 12 hours, so it's quite responsive. Bitcoins is every two weeks, just to give you a, a comparative scale. Now, when lots of miners come onto the network and hash rate, hash rate increases, you're going to get a speeding up of blocks. More hash power before the difficulty adjusts means blocks are going to come in faster. And likewise, when lots of miners are turning off their rigs, you're going to get slower blocks because there's the same difficulty puzzle, the same size haystack, but less people looking for the needle. Now, the right-hand side or the oscillator here to the right-hand side is measured in seconds. And it's more or less an oscillator saying how many seconds is on average is the decred chain mining blocks faster or slower than the target. So when we're actually sitting, let's say this point here at a value oscillating around zero, this is more or less perfectly balanced. This means the amount of hash power on the network is balanced with the uh, the current difficulty. And this period through here, which is actually when ASICs went live, you can see that block times got uh, minus uh, negative, which means that they're shorter. The block times are much shorter. And what this suggests is that there's lots of hash power coming on and the difficulty isn't adjusting in time. And these extended periods of time is really what drives this particular market. So this is saying that there is a rapid expansion of hash power that is continuing for long periods. And conversely, a capitulation is signaled by a speeding up of block times over time um, and for an extended period of time. And this is where we can actually see that there is a capitulation going on um, during 20, uh, 2020. There's this layer of capitulation that's occurring.
um, as you know, as basically as miners are turning off their rigs and uh, and and trying to deal with the reduced uh, income stream that's coming in. So really, we're seeing a confluence between the mining pulse and what we saw further up here of the pure multiple at these two different levels. So that brings us to the end of this. Um, really, what's very interesting about this, we've looked at the history, we've looked at all the different rigs. Um, what's very clear out of all of this is that ASICs have launched into a very, very difficult mining market. Every single ASIC that came out more or less was superseded quite quickly by a new device. And all this was occurring at the same time as the hash power was actually uh, expanding rapidly whilst price was actually falling. So that meant that minor income was reducing despite there being more competition. And that actually resulted in, based on this study, it resulted in a large portion of the ASIC mining uh, facilities, most likely not actually breaking even. They may have made money if they uh, managed it up front and they came on the network and they were you know, top dog for a short period of time. If they managed their treasuries and their sales um, correctly at that point in time, they may have broken even. But the, the cutthroat nature between a 7.5 cent and a 12.5 cent all-in cost being a make or break level shows how competitive this actually is. Um, so what is very clear is that ASICs have had a very hard go, but they are staking, right? That it's that Some of those coins may have then been sold on, but that supports that treasury notion. And what we're actually seeing is that there are some, starting to be some green shoots on the other side of this. The on-chain metrics are suggesting that uh, blocks are coming in a little bit faster. The pure multiple has now bounced back up above the over, oversold region. Uh, we're seeing the difficulty ribbon start to unfurl, and we're back above that proof of work line and coming in for the uh, the total rewards line on the block subsidy model. So there's lots of different layers that are starting to suggest we've got an increase in hash rate that is starting to push the network back onto the other side of capitulation. And the nature of mining is you do need miners to capitulate in order to start constraining supply and then the strong miners gaining that hash share. So that's that cyclical behavior that we've seen. And what is the most important, I think, is that during this entire process of the Decred mining network, Proof of work has done exactly what it needed to do. It has imbued DCR coins with an unforgeable costliness. It has ensured that the chain has remained um, competitive in, in a security standpoint. And it's, uh, you know, it competes with the best of them in terms of security assurances. And I think most importantly, for a chain like Decred, where DCR coins are the vote of governance, it has distributed those coins far and wide in a very, very fair and, uh, and even distribution. There's been ample opportunity with the miners selling um, in order to cover their costs for people to actually get in and, 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 and acquire DCR at all manner of uh, cheap price points uh, relative to its historical trading. So in this light, proof of work has actually worked exceptionally well for Decred. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for uh, reading through the paper if you do get through to it. If you have any questions, be sure to, to reach me on, on Twitter or Reddit or otherwise. And uh, otherwise, thanks for, thanks for sticking around. Cheers. Decred is secure, adaptable, sustainable. Learn more at decred.org.